Okay, then I will bring the January 11th Economic Development Subcommittee to order. And pursuant to government code section 54953E and the recommendation of the health officer of the County of Sonoma, Economic Development Subcommittee will be participating in this meeting via Zoom webinar. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and as noted on the agenda. Um, Ms. Cleary, could you uh, review how the public may comment? Certainly. Um, good morning. Members of the public wishing to speak during item three, public comment, or during any of the scheduled items will be able to do so by utilizing the raised hand feature, or if calling in by pressing star nine on their phone. They will then be given the ability to address the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. And could you please call the roll, Ms. Cleary? Certainly. Member Alvarez? Present. Member Fleming? Present. Chair Sawyer? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if you wish to make a comment on via Zoom, please select the raise hand button. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Each speaker has three minutes. A countdown timer will appear to the for the convenience of the speaker and viewers. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of that countdown. And at this point, I would like to ask if there are any public comments on items not on our agenda this morning, Ms. Cleary. We have, uh, uh, yes, we do. We, uh, gentleman Thomas, hold on just one moment while I pull up the screen. And Thomas, uh, you should be able to unmute if you would please confirm your ability to see the timer on the screen. Uh, good morning. Yes, I think so. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, good morning, all, and Happy New Year. Uh, I wanted to come in and, and do forgive me. Uh, I think it is important for the economic development of Santa Rosa to mention this. And, and I, in the one hand, it's kind of, you know, wonderful that we have a new uh, general manager of SMART. Uh, on the other hand, we still have this impediment, uh, which is uh, Jennings Crossing. And, and we have a new city manager. So it's really great. It's a great opportunity to get on the right foot. Um, and uh, there, so there have been some discussions, and I would like to discuss it with the city what those discussions were. Haven't had that opportunity yet, uh, but what I wanted to point out is we're not going to be able to pass the smart tax extension if we do not get the Jennings Crossing uh, from Smart. So I know the city wants it. I know there's a lawsuit. Um, uh, we we know that. Uh, but we need to get an agreement. We need to have a settlement of this. It can't just continue out in Phenotum and this lawsuit and they're waiting, stalling, doing everything. Um, and so uh, my point is that the, the sentiment is such that it will not be better than the last time we had the vote. And any time we go forward, it's worse and going to be worse and worse. We need to have people in support. So we have to get this crossing or there will be deleterious effects. And one, just one major deleterious effect is that there's about $700 million invested in SMART so far of the tax money and, and the federal money. And that would end in 2028. So you could just picture six years of the loss of $100 million a year to this community. Just imagine, it, it would be all of a sudden, it would be at the end, but it would be like a $100 million a year loss uh, from now till then, if we were to lose SMART. So we have to come together and we have to get the Jennings Crossing to do it because the people won't vote. They won't vote for it. And we, we know that, we've already seen that. So I just wanna mention that and not to put a pall on things, but to actually turn things around to think we have the opportunity, we have this great opportunity. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thomas. 
Any other public comments on items not on the agenda, Ms. Cleary? We have no additional hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Well, then we'll move on with our agenda. Uh, Ms. De La Rosa, um, could you introduce the Economic Development Strat Plan? Yeah, so I just wanted to give you a quick update um, as we make our way through the iterative design phase of this plan. Um, and um, as that um, phase um, implies, we're making changes to the plan um, before we finalize it. Um, so next slide, please. Um, yeah, my side. And uh, so just um, this one, I just want to let you know, we've not changed anything. Uh, just a reminder, this is our draft mission, uh, vision, mission, and theory of change. Nothing has changed on that. We feel um, uh, comfortable and proud of uh, where that stands now and have had, uh, as we've been socializing the plan with um, a few people to get feedback, nothing on this has changed. So next slide. But what has changed is um, we had originally uh, in the first drafts uh, had four goals. Um, and when we were discussing these, realized that two of the four goals um, could be consolidated um, to address things in a different way. And then really when we started looking at um, our resources and um, what uh, some of the goals sort of laid out to be um, that they were not going to be really accomplishable uh, in a meaningful way that would uh, advance the objectives of the, of the strategic plan. So, so we, it is in the last two goals, which I'll explain to you that we kind of looked at. Um, the other thing that when, as we were talking about the plan, um, we realized is that, um, you know, the build out of the goals, uh, kind of uh, presented us a, a better um, uh, opportunity in updating goal three. And in that goal one is really about innovation or you know what's our mentality or, or MO within the division. Um, goal two addresses historic oversights. Um, so it's who, how, and why are we um, addressing some of the issues that we're addressing. And then goal three, the, the previous one, um, goal three used to be specific to young people and education. So it was uh, equip young people with knowledge, skills, resources, and opportunities, and build their power to participate in and contribute to the Santa Rosa community workforce and economy. So really we were looking at future workforce and goal four was support policies uh, that drive the development of inclusive mixed use, multifamily housing and priority development areas. So again, um, uh, continue to focus on our um, our housing needs. Um, and what we realized is really those two are issues of the day. So if we're going to build from goal one and goal two, really what we need is a, a consolidated goal three that better um, represents the broad issues of the day. So this is now uh, goal three is drive policies and leverage partnerships to address urgent economic challenges. Uh, and improve uh, livability across Santa Rosa. Um, and so again, within this, we've got um, youth and also childcare and the housing policies that we're looking to focus on. So as we, um, as we come a little bit closer to finalizing the plan, um, I just wanna give you uh, periodic updates on where we stand um, in order to actually have an achievable plan that links effectively with council goals, uh, the general plan update and our seed collaborative and any of the other sort of large um, strategies that, that are being developed in the city. So that's it. That's well, Personally, anytime we can consolidate without diluting the intention of the goal is, is I'm all for that and, and, and creating clarity. Um, any comments, Victoria or Eddie on the, on the change? Yeah, um, I like it. I like that it's a little bit more elegant and um, I like that you express that it's gonna be more achievable. And I didn't feel that it dilutes the, the either of the other goals and that you specifically call out the, the areas and the other, the previous two goals, three and four in this goal. So uh, it has my enthusiastic support. Excellent, thank you, Eddie. Well, for me, Raisa, you know that anything that you do, 
I absolutely appreciate. So <laughs> continue forward, sister, continue forward. Thank you. Thank That's you it. both. Madam Cleary, or Madam, uh, uh, Ms. Cleary, do we have any um, public comment at this point? We do not, nor do we have any um, voicemails or emails for this meeting. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so, Ms. De La Rosa, the next item. Yeah, so we're going to actually elevate uh, Alan Alton, uh, Brandilyn Trammell, and uh, Jeff Burke um, for this item. Um, so, uh, you know, as we've been going through our strategic plan uh, and planning process, we've been um, identifying things and trying to move in, a, in an expedited manner on certain um, items or tools that we think um, might be um, helpful to us in, um, in achieving some of our goals. And I have to say in advance of this, this may or may not be one of them. We are interested in your, um, your input on this, um, but this was brought up to us um, outside of this committee uh, as an interest to sort of uh, review the local pro preference and procurement um, uh, process uh, specific to, um, you know, to economic development. Um, and let's see, I hope uh, Alan and the, Alan's gonna actually take this item uh, and introduce it, but I have to say in advance, cause I'm not sure if he's gonna say this, this is the ninth time this has been reviewed and we keep coming to the same place with it because it's not, uh, it, because it's been working. Um, but are there opportunities and, um, and it, would this be the right tool? So with that, I'm gonna ask Alan to take it away. Thanks, Trey. So welcome, Alan. Thank you, John and the rest of the committee. And Ray, so thank you very much. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so what we have here is, is uh, for the purpose of this item and an overview of where we are with our current local preference uh, policy. Uh, as Ray mentioned, this has been brought up uh, a few times. And um, uh, uh, we have reviewed this before in the um, long-term uh, financial policy and audit subcommittee. Uh, uh, we are not proposing a, a recommendation at, at this time. This is just to set context, but we do, and I'll get to this toward the end there. We, uh, we do anticipate coming back to the committee uh, with a recommendation um, in another meeting or so. So uh, the definition of uh, local preference is uh, it occurs when a local firm is, is favored in a procurement uh, over non-local firms um, uh, uh, for reasons unrelated to the procurement itself, typically uh, to support the local economy. And we apply this to goods and or services. Uh, next slide, please. So there, there are a number of types of preferences. So there are second chance bids, which is when a local firm is offered the chance to match the lowest bid. Uh, there are tie bids when the bid of a local bidder is the same as, as uh, a non-local bid. Uh, percentage bids when uh, the local bid falls within a certain percentage of that lowest non-local bid, uh, reciprocal bids, uh, uh, absolute bids, and bidding or value credits. Um, so those are the different types of preferences that exist out there. We do have on the next slide our current local preference code. So it is in the uh, the next slide, please. So it is uh, in the city code chapter 3-08. Dot 130.i, uh, which is a 1% preference in determining low monetary bid up to $5,000. Uh, business entity, entity must prove uh, principal place of business within Santa Rosa. It only applies to formal written solicited uh, bids for goods and general services, does not apply to public works because that's precluded by law. And uh, uh, we do not apply it to professional services contracts. Uh, our code does comply with Prop 209, uh, which uh, prohibits consideration of race, 
sex or ethnicity. Uh, federal mandates, however, regarding uh, minority and women-owned uh, procurement uh, uh, goals uh, do exist uh, uh, in transit and CIP. Next slide, please. So uh, definition. So we talk about goods and services. So goods are tangible or physical products. General services are work performed or services rendered by an independent contractor, i.e. custodial services or building and equipment maintenance, equipment rental, et cetera. Uh, professional services, those are architects, engineers, attorneys, other consultants or individuals possessing a high degree of technical skill. And then there are several types of, of enterprises. Uh, um, so we, we have disadvantaged uh, business enterprises, which are small businesses where socially and economically disadvantaged individuals own at least 51% of the business and control management um, and daily operations. There are minority business enterprises where 51% of the business is owned by minority individuals and management and daily operations are controlled by those minority group members. And then there are women business enterprises where 51% of the business is owned by managed and daily operations are controlled by women. So next slide. So we, we went back and looked at uh, uh, where our registered vendors and our bid awards. So in 2019, um, uh, uh, we do have uh, a number of registered vendors that, that fall within the disadvantaged business enterprises. There's 9% of those are registered, 4% uh, uh, are minority business enterprises, and 4% are um, uh, women um, uh, business enterprises. Uh, we do have about 23% of our registered vendors are local. Um, and then we have uh, about 57% are outside of the local area. Um, and then in terms of bid awards, we do award locally um, uh, quite often. Uh, 43%, so almost half. Um, uh, and we do uh, uh, or have done bid awards to, uh, say, uh, um, disadvantaged business enterprises as well. Um, so next slide, please. So this is where we get to the discussion topic. So we, we, we have all the backup data of kind of where we are and where we want to go. Um, or at least what, what the thoughts are where we can go. So, you know, what, what objectives do we want to achieve uh, through uh, uh, either changing or, or our local preference uh, policy? Um, uh, you know, what, what, what tools do the, do the council and, uh, already have? What criteria should we look at? Those types of things. Uh, I know internally, uh, uh, staff is looking at at those sites, and that's why uh, um, I, I mentioned that we would come back in March uh, at a later date, and we're, we're targeting March to come back, be able to explore uh, a lot of these areas, lay out uh, what uh, is available to us right now, what the reality of the types of Goods and services that would be affected by a change in our in our um, preference policy, and then make a recommendation on where we can go from uh, from there. Uh, the next step beyond that would be to then take it to the council and and have something uh, adopted at that point. So with that, uh, if there's any questions or we want to kick off the discussion, I know uh, I'm here. Uh, available for those, uh, I believe our purchasing agent is on the line, uh, who could help out and Rice, uh, of course, could help out as well. Thanks, Alan. Brandlin, could you introduce yourself, please? You bet. Good morning. My name is Brandilyn Trammell. I am the purchasing agent for the city of Santa Rosa. 
Great, and thank you for being here this morning. And I'm, and I'm, I'm curious, and good morning, Jeff. Um, the, in the, the items for discussion, uh, so you mentioned you would be bringing this back to hopefully, if, if, if time permits, uh, in March. And so we can come to kind of completion on this, this particular item uh, and this, this, this challenge. The, um, during this time between now and March, when it comes back to council, will, uh, will staff be looking at whether or not we have uh, gone as far as we can with our uh, local preference uh, ordinance? Um, I know this. We've been we've discussed this in, uh, several times at our uh, long-term financial planning and audit subcommittee. So I'm I'm curious if we are, and I'm going to entertain questions from from the uh, from Victoria and and Eddie as well, and and anyone on on the panel at this point. Um, but I'm curious. It, 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 the next couple of months we'll be um, looking at potential changes, or we may be leaving it as it is and uh, basically looking at within within the restrictions of, of state and federal law, um, whether or not we have gone as far as we can uh, with our local local preference. I guess that's kind of my question is, is that what you'll be doing in the next couple of months and then bringing a, 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 a little package to, to, to the council? And will it go to the long-term financial policy and audit subcommittee first, or is it going to go directly to council? Well, it would go to this subcommittee uh, uh, first. So that's the intent, is to come back here to this committee in March. Uh, uh, we, we may also go to the long-term uh, 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 finance subcommittee. However, I, I mean, yeah, so we, we may do that. There, there could be a cost uh, component depending on, on what recommendation we make. So uh, if that's the case, I think it could make sense to go uh, to the uh, to the other subcommittee or uh, um, uh, we could just go direct, you know, based on the direction from this subcommittee, go straight to the council and have the discussion there. Uh, we hope to be able to, you know, based off of the prior conversations that we've had, uh, we know some of the interests and some of the uh, the thoughts on what we can do uh, in changing the, the code. Um, uh, I, I don't know that we have, um, you know, this provides us an opportunity to lay it out again and to, uh, um, I'm hoping to show uh, some examples of what would, what could happen uh, by making uh, uh, certain changes. Um, and again, uh, emphasizing those things that the council could do uh, within um, legal requirements uh, uh, or you know existing law um, uh, at their own uh, um, uh, their their own uh, um, actions could take. That's okay. a very inartfully way of putting that, but <laughs> the council does have things that they can do, and and I don't know that we've laid that out uh, as as well as we could have in the past so that's my goal is to is to give you know uh, uh, the cost benefits the the various options that are there and try to put this to somehow uh, land this particular plane that has been floating around for quite some time and I, I just want to add to Randolin, that oh, I'm sorry if, if I can I just want to sure. add to that um, just to be clear, it is the benefit of going through the various subcommittees is to understand the intent and the desires broadly um, and for staff to be able to explain the implications because sometimes it's not just to say finance or to Brandolin specifically or to other, but what are the implications and then also what are the, the, the legal parameters because we can also identify potentially other vehicles to achieve your goals. But I think one of the things that's, um, that's been interesting about learning about this process is um, understanding the various objectives that, that council may have and understanding where those might be applied. Um, so this is one thing might be laying this to rest, like maybe we do change the percentage, maybe we do add some things that are legally allowed but what we can also identify your objectives and see if there are another, other ways 
to achieve some of your goals that would not be legally viable through this vehicle. Right. I'll be curious that I'm very curious about those other avenues that we may be able to go down. And that's part of what you'll be looking at and what the staff and, and, and the various subcommittees will be will have an opportunity to weigh in on because there are the the um, this particular ordinance is not the is not the only way to achieve our goals. And Brandon, I know you you like to weigh in or, or give uh, any uh, some questions or comments. Um, yes, if I may. Um, I feel like purchasing is at this meeting in order to really refresh the conversation around identifying the objectives. Um, absolutely, to my counterpart's points, there are opportunities either um, further develop or expand um, our local preference policies. I think our biggest challenge right now in identifying objectives is how do we back through the current systems, especially the data-driven systems that we have available to us and seek the, the data to understand where we could potentially do more work or provide you better, more clear results um, on our local preference as it stands now and how we can better identify to council going forward, not just um, for formal solicitations. Um, I wanna remind this group that our current policy and those the data that you see from 2019 is not the complete picture. Um, those are graphs taken from our um, electronic website, Planet Bids. And so we don't have a way, for example, to acquire the data now for all the micro and small purchases that occur, maybe through a three quote process where we'd only use local vendors or when you use your procurement card and you use a local vendor. So if, if your objective is to really drill down in the data, that's something that we could look forward to trying to achieve in March. The other place that really understanding what goals you want to achieve is coming back to even the multiple subcommittees in March and having these conversations about of those options um, on a previous slide, what would be a best fit for how we with a very small staff, we only have five people um, in our procurement staff that, that provide all of our vendor outreach and internal support to nearly 1200 employees. So how do we best apply it which of those models would work the best for us? And then how do we capture that data to give you a clearer picture of what's really happening? And then we would follow that up with a full um, educational platform to all city employees so that they understand that model and can apply it uh, to things um, that they're purchasing under that $10,000 threshold, which will happen outside of procurement. And how do we make sure they're capturing that data so that we can really give you viable results? Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And it's also going to be very important for, our, for the vendors across the city and those that would be, that could want to participate in this ordinance um, with, that's fully understood by them as well so that they can take advantage of it um, in, in the future. Um, Victoria, Eddie, um, questions or comments at this point before I go to public comment? Victoria? Yeah, um, I, I like John share a great interest in hearing about the legally allowable avenues to achieve these goals um, more broadly, but I don't know that this is today is the day that we're going to go over all of that. The other question I have is, and I'm not sure if this is for Brandilyn or Raisa, which is what is the gold standard? Like what, what jurisdiction is doing this and knocking it out of the park? Um, have we looked at other, I, I know you guys like to look at other jurisdictions and see who's doing this well and what they're doing differently. Well, uh, I'll let Brandilyn answer because she is just a phenomenal wealth of information. Um, but you know, if we look at a gold standard, um, we're also understanding um, that they come with them large departments um, or other resources that, um, that allow them to do this. And so even if we look at a gold standard, say Oakland has some good examples, um, you know, what, if we look at what they're doing, is there another way to do it to where we don't have to add um, people to do the, uh, uh, what's it like, um, the deep dive in some of the uh, compliance things. Um, so Brandilyn, do you, you, you had some great examples of, of ideas and you're on mute. 
Um, yes, I was uh, a little surprised by this meeting. We we came up on this very quickly, so I don't have any data currently available. I certainly can come back with some more results. I I would thank Councilmember Fleming that you're interested also in looking at maybe what Sonoma County has um, and and the data that they collect. I'm not certain. Um, and to Reyes's point, um, Oakland does have a very robust program, I would want to be able to look through those things and also um, look to the National Board of Certified Procurement Professionals and see if there are studies out there that would give us uh, a good example of what uh, a success story looks like. I would say, though, just in general, in my expertise of um, buying local, we are doing a very strong job. If you look at that slide number six, and I know that data is a little stale, but I felt like the pandemic um, response to especially emergency procurement might skew the results that we have currently um, with over 43% of, and remember bid awards means that that is just the data that's coming off written bid procedures through purchasing that happen on our electronic platform. That doesn't count all the things like when we hire plumbers, we only do a solicitation to locals to ensure outreach and because we don't wanna minimize our response by forcing them onto the electronic platform. Um, those aren't part of the system yet and we should be able to gather that information soon. Okay. Victoria, I wonder if like, like, I think that the most common question we get and um, one of the things that, um, well, that I've heard, I just can't say we get because I don't generally work in the field, but um, uh, in hearing what um, Alan Bramlin has talked about and then some of the interest that brought this forward is the question of um, you know, diversity or equity. Can you do it not just for local, um, but for um, other considerations? And that's where, again, in that legal thing where it's like, well, we'd like to um, highlight women or minorities um, and that's where we're precluded by Prop 209 from doing anything. Um, but are there other places that have sort of found workarounds? Probably, um, but uh, it, it's that um, our ability to walk that line or to watch the way other people are walking that line is, is where our, um, we have some concerns. Um, but but I think that's where um, where other that I've heard other jurisdictions are most frequently brought up. And Jeff Jeff may want to comment on this as well. But I believe that where we see the inclusion of any federal SBA or disadvantaged business enterprise in a preference policy is due to um, very long. Uh, they, they usually take a, around two years of disparity studies that can actually prove that in that jurisdiction over time, there has been discrimination involved in their contracting practices. And I believe that that is where the lean in on 209 um, that allows for some of that practice to occur. If Jeff has anything else to say around that, that would be great. So maybe I'll just jump in and give you just a quick overview. So let me just start with Prop 209. So in 1996, the voters in California passed what uh, changed the California Constitution and prohibited uh, public sector employers and public sector contracting from giving preferences based on race or gender. And so what that left uh, public agencies to do was to do things like outreach, both in employment and in contracting, and to do things that are kind of race and gender neutral that might help those kinds of businesses uh, enable them to uh, make it uh, maybe package an RFP in a way that you unbundle them and make them smaller or figure out creative ways to encourage all businesses because it has to be on its face or race and gender neutral. And that's where some of the cities like Oakland and others have, have uh, a, a somewhat more robust uh, preference policies. Um, what Brandilyn was mentioned about a disparity study, 
Um, so there, there is the ability for a local agency, and I'll tell you that San Francisco is the only one that I know of in the state that has conducted a disparity study and found that to remedy the effects of intentional discrimination in its jurisdiction, that it now has some ability. And again, like Brandilyn said, I mean, I just got into this at the end of last week, um, but to my knowledge, San Francisco is the only one that's been able to kind of prove that up and to have a more robust ordinance. And it, as Brandilyn mentioned, it took a couple of years of a study and I don't know what we may or may not find here in Santa Rosa, um, but that, that's kind of the big picture uh, lay of the land. And, and I'll also add that you may recall just a couple of years ago, um, the, it came back before the voters to see if they wanted to uphold Prop 209. I think it was, I wanna say Prop 16, and, uh, and it lost uh, like 55 to 45. So anyway, that, that's kind of the, the, the legal framework uh, in, in a nutshell. Okay. Well, thank you all. And, and I do think that if it came back now, it might even have a better chance of being repealed given the, the political climate that we find ourselves in. A, a couple of comments. One is that, you know, I know we're not uh, the size of Oakland, certainly nowhere near as well resourced as San Francisco. And I, I hear that this came across your desk relatively recently. Um, so, you know, a couple of things to that. One is, I believe in our staff and in your ability to find creative solutions when given the right support and the right amount of time. And so I defer to you to take the time that you need to figure out what the workarounds are. But I also encourage you as we're moving further and further into our equity journey to come and tell us what you need and let us say, you know what, we're not going to fund that or we are going to fund that because what I feel like we're running into more and more and what I observe more than I even feel is that uh, we're finding out that creating systems that are equitable do cost some money and they certainly cost resources and we can't rely on you to do it all on, you know, stolen time here or there from your main job duties. And so, you know, from my perspective, you won't be penalized from saying, you know, here's what Oakland does. We could do that, but we would need to add three staff members. And this is what the cost would be. And here's what the benefit that Oakland sees, could, you know, and, and do you want to make that investment? And um, rather than coming to us and saying, you know what, we just can't do it because we're too small. I, I hope that it's a combination of, you know, we could, here's the Cadillac plan, or you could have, you know, a silver or gold plan that is some of these workarounds, or we can do a mix of it and let us um, figure out how best to support you. So please don't be shy. I know that we're always in budgetary constraints, but this is a huge priority for the council and, and your judgment on these matters is, is taken very seriously. So if, if I could follow up on that or just follow to that, that that's, you actually took the words out of my mouth. That, that's where we were gonna go. And that's why we're not prepared to offer any recommendations right now. Uh, we need the opportunity to uh, look at those gold standards that are out there, see how they can work in uh, Santa Rosa, whether, you know, some of them, uh, I know in past conversations we've had, there's been some suggestions of things that are occurring in other states. And we just simply can't do those here because of the, of the laws in California. So we need to look at that. So what, what are legal uh, restrictions? And then also to look at uh, what resources and to be able to um, uh, lay out those, those, again, costs, benefits, to be able to have something go forward and which it does bring up a good point of why it probably needs to go to both subcommittees to one, look at how we can achieve a goal and still provide all those costs, but then also to update the other subcommittee on, on uh, how this follows in with our, with our long-term budget planning and, and things like that, because they, they do have, have long-term implications, but uh, often, those long-term implications uh, 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 have a benefit that outweighs that. And so those are the things that we want to be able to present fully. And, and so that's why we needed a little extra time to be able to do that. Again, we're targeting March. 
Um, we'd rather not have it slip any further than that. Uh, but that we think that that'll give us enough time to be able to do that type of analysis and bring in a more uh, uh, well-rounded uh, uh, recommendation to y'all. All right, that sounds great. Um, I have a follow-up on that um, as well, because I'm trying to get um, to-dos as we go through this. And one of them, uh, I'll, and then also again, um, look for other vehicles. Um, so one of them is, you know, looking into doing a disparity report. Um, and so we can look at the um, report that Oakland's doing, um, what the cost is, the breadth of it, uh, because that aligns very specifically with the economic development uh, uh, strategy goal two, um, which is collect, compile, synthesize, and analyze data to understand characteristics of our own businesses. Um, so that's one thing. And I think... Um, as we look at that, we'll have to look broadly and uh, not just finance, not just specific to this, but just um, uh, uh, what the implications are across the board. And I, this, I just wanna hit on uh, Alan's point of going to long-term finance as well as economic development, because there are actually two points on this. One is it's the cost to the city, right? Mm -hmm. But the other, and that's the immediate cost for, for this, um, local preference ordinance. That's one thing. The other is the multiplier effect and the long-term return on investment and the implication of our businesses and the ability of our businesses to do business with the city and the city support of those businesses in return. So those, um, you know, I think the interest is to, for those to go hand in hand. Um, we have obligations to the taxpayers. We have opportunities with our businesses. Um, and so I think uh, the value should should be considered both ways. I would I would like to make one more point too that we will bring back in March for further discussion and some examples. Um, the hot button normally for council awarded goods or general services is really around vehicle purchases. Um, we've had several bids in years past that even with the preference applied have been very tight. Um, with that said, I want to remind the subcommittee, and we will definitely remind the council as a whole at some point, that council has authority already built into the code to um, provide for a waiver of competitive bid when it's in the best interest of our city, and that is the language verbatim. We have every opportunity at, to also kind of synthesize down future needs that we can kind of see coming, particularly vehicle replacements, um, pointed at the Ford uh, models that we have standardized for police uh, specifically. Um, that is a perfect example because we only have one vendor in the city, um, which is Hansel Ford, who has that vehicle available to us. So we don't even have any other local competition other than Hansel. Um, purchasing could absolutely come to the council requesting a waiver of competitive bid and um, work directly with that vendor to provide for a long-term agreement for those Ford vehicles that would easily be able to show profit and um, keep those dollars within the city. Um, I'd have to do some further research to see if there were any other good specific purchases that we might be able to do a bid waiver or limit the bid to a local businesses only that would be a benefit to our city from a preference standard and also allow us to keep our dollars as local as possible while still providing some level of competition and lowest responsive bid paradigm for our taxpayers. Appreciate that. And it's that kind of analysis that I know the council will be looking for um, and that kind of creativity as well that our that our vendors, potential vendors will be looking for as well. So it, it sounds, you know, a, a local preference ordinance sounds uh, on its surface fairly simple, but clearly it's not. And uh, so we really appreciate it. And I, uh, I agree with Victoria that you know, if, if more time is needed um, so that we can, uh, in a sense, you know, come up with a nice comprehensive ordinance and then, and then put it behind us so that not only the, the council can move on, but that the, our vendors and uh, those that are, that are looking to do business with the city um, can have a clear understanding of, of their opportunities and, and, and responsibilities. So um, uh, that, that's exactly why if more time is needed, I, I think you uh, please take it. Um, to be able to come back and and come to a come to completion uh, on this on this topic, which I know everyone is looking forward to. Eddie, do you have any questions or comments at this point? Oh no, sir. Everything's been uh, very well said. 
including Victoria's comment about us being there uh, in support of, of staff, as well as her statement regarding uh, should they need something come with that ask, opposed to uh, just saying we need it. Uh, I, I did want to introduce myself to Brandon. It's nice to meet you. And, and um, I look forward to looking at a report that does include the, the, the items that didn't meet the threshold, such as the plumbers or, or anything of that nature, that would increase the, the graph that shows that we are definitely going for that 40 something percent of local businesses. So I do appreciate that very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Eddie. Well, if there are no other comments from um, those attending here, I'd like to move it to public comment. Um, do we have any public comment at this point? Um, we do. Um, just one moment while I share the screen. Thank you. And Thomas, do you have the ability to speak at this point? If you would please confirm your ability to see the screen. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Great. Well, this is uh, was timely that I came on just to speak about SMART, but uh, that would also have many implications that I was trying to allude to before for the local economy, but specifically about city contracting, um, uh, the, uh, the economic principle of what's called the circular flow is the foundation of uh, fractional reserve banking. And uh, it's a multiplier effect of 10 times. So uh, it's a well-known principle within economics that uh, investment or purchases produce 10 times their uh, economic value uh, locally and uh, or, or generally. So, so uh, people who come in to take away those, that produces those benefits to those areas that take that uh, purchase away from the local community. Uh, one aspect of that can be seen in the 49ers who uh, came and began mining and the prices escalated tremendously. And that's because they didn't really have any other markets that could compete. And so what happens is you can see dynamically when your prices go off the chart that uh, you're, you're no longer competitive. And and that's the thing you want to avoid. So you can see that in a, a supply and demand curve in the marginal cost of those purchases. You can see it relatively quickly that you're uh, exceeding your local capacity, which you're not. And I want to point out that um, a specific thing that I think we're all pretty well aware of was the district mapping for the county and the change of the board uh the districts and they went outside of the community to hire that person and he had no idea what were communities of interest in this community and i think that that as an anthropologist um you know and an engineer and so on that are things that i have capacity for that that was a travesty not to have someone uh, with local knowledge here about how the communities exist for instance, to me, it's travesty again that that the the uh, the cemeteries, the Santa Rosa Memorial Cemetery and the the rural cemetery, were not included in Santa Rosa. So those are represented by James Gore, and that is ridiculous. Number one, they don't affect any vote. Okay, there's no vote there; just include it. But they couldn't do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have an ad additional member of the public who would like to speak, uh, Mr. Gregory Ferron. Mr. Ferron, do you have the ability to speak? If you would confirm your ability to see the timer, please. Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah, I got on this. Yeah, um, sorry, I apologize. I came in late to this uh, meeting, but I wanted to just mention one other uh, purchase process that I recognize having watched the city for a long time. Uh, and that's professional service agreements. Uh, consultants always seem to come from somewhere outside the city, somewhere far away, and they basically tell us what we already know uh, and, and really leave no expertise behind or any kind of uh, 
um, uh, personal reward to the city beyond the actual study. So I'd like to nominate that if you're looking for things that you might want to figure out whether or not you could have a local preference for, um, it would be consultants and professional service agreements. Um, uh, that's my only contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have no additional hands raised at this time. Thanks, Eileen. Appreciate it. Um, well, if there are no further questions or comments, I think we have reached the end of our agenda. Anything else that you want to bring up, Raisa? Yeah, there was just the um, the uh, department report or, or staff reports. Um, and I just wanted to give you an update on one thing. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it's um, item four on the agenda. But real quick, Raisa, are you going on to the next topic? Because I did have one quick little question oh, about the yeah. last thing, uh, or not a question, it's just a heads up that when it does come back, um, if it's possible and not too onerous, one piece of data that I would like to have, um, I know that you break it down into women-owned business and minority-owned business, but I would love to have a breakdown of the percentage of dollar-wise. It doesn't have to be like, it could be a percentage of contracts, but also maybe a, a percentage of dollars awarded by the city based on, on gender and ethnicity. Um, I know that that might be a step too far in terms of analysis. And if it is, you know, I get it. Um, but if that data does come forward, I think it'd be really interesting and, and informative. And sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. I will take a look and see if that's even a possibility right now that data is grouped into people to vendors who are self-certified. So I don't believe on the certification itself that they drill down to that level of granularity, but I will certainly check. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, we can look into, um, cause Brendan had some good ideas on how to uh, make more robust our business tax certificates in order for it to be easier for us to be able to track things. So we're gonna um, have, uh, other conversations about that. Um, and then um, she had ideas on, because um, it has to be self-certified or self-stated on how that looks in um, our, our fees or whatever whatever the, the uh, method is by which we receive um, proposals, I guess. Um, so um, it's instigated a whole conversation on the, um, the backup information that we need and how we might be able to get that. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll start stepping through those things. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's, um, and then also I just have to say, we wanna loosen Socorro because she's looking at all of these uh, uh, ec policies from an equity standpoint within the city, as I understand it. Um, and she tends to have a good idea of, um, of, of those kinds of questions. And I think we've found a number of those kinds of questions as we go along. Okay, so uh, item four is, I just wanna give you an update on um, something that happened last night. Um, uh, uh, very quickly, um, we had the Art and Public Places Committee last night. It was a special meeting of the Art and Public Places Committee um, and they were addressing the, um, the Unum sculpture, which if you recall is the public art sculpture that's going into the courthouse square on the 4th Street side. Uh, and what they considered last night were the uh, words and the languages that are going to be shown on the sculpture. So the sculpture itself is a, is a beautiful sort of poetic looking uh, piece that has words on it in uh, what will be 17 languages or 19 if we um, get technical on this. Uh, that were words that were chosen by the community. Um, and it's beautiful, you'll start seeing this, but we're gonna put out an update um, a little bit later uh, on it. There were uh, 18 words and um, 17 languages. I say 19 because um, there, there's two Chinese and two Persian languages. So we have Farsi and, uh, Farsi and Dari and then Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, and then um, there were questions about um, why didn't we include certain other languages. Uh, um, there, I think, is a lot of chatter about um, uh, some uh, languages of cultural importance. Um, and um, this has gone through a very public process. Um, and our concern uh, moving forward is how do you um, change on the fly without reopening the process for language? 
Uh, and how do we say one say um, one you. language is more important than another language, um, or this religion is more important than that religion uh, in terms of language? So, um, so we uh, it was a very good conversation last night, um, and again the culmination of a long, robust public process. And um, based on that. Um, and the recommendation of the committee, the Art and Public Places Committee, decided to uh, use the list of words that um, and, and the languages that were recommended um, as most commonly spoken in Santa Rosa now, in sort of a, 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 a now and looking forward kind of perspective on language. So um, we will be giving you more updates as, on that as it goes along, but um, it was a great conversation on, um, on another function area of the Economic Development Division. And that, Chair Sawyer, is the end of the report. Well, I'm glad you finished with that because you know it just it goes to show, you know, regardless of how hard people try to be comprehensive and and thoughtful and 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 intentional, that sometimes uh, things fall off the 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 chart. And I'm so pleased that the community came together and looked at these recommendations because it is a very elegant piece. It will be, I'm very much looking forward to its production and installation. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm pleased that the, the people were watching and that people made, that they noticed and made the recommendations because that's really what it's all about. It's, it's, it, it did nothing but improve the nature of that piece, which again is, is, is quite elegant. And I'm looking forward to, to it being something that we can all enjoy and that everyone can enjoy. So thank you for that. Um, I think what I, if, if there are no, Question: Any questions about um, item number four? Because I'm I, I'm I'm going to open it up to public comment. I, Eileen, do we have any uh, public comment on um, agenda item number four? Oops. Yeah, we have one public comment. Um, Thank you. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, just one moment while we, um, there we go, just one second. And Thomas, you have the ability to speak. If you would please confirm your ability to see the timer. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, I did not believe that this would be an opportunity to comment on this particular item uh, at this time. I participated in the Art and Public Places meeting uh, to suggest that we have art on the Elliot and Edwards overcrossing pedestrian bridge uh, to signify SMART's location um and at, that was the reason i was on there when they were speaking about this art piece i was staying on to to respectfully hear what was going on in the meeting as i am at this time and um uh so they listed languages and the two languages that are not going to be included are two languages that are under um, uh, uh, not just federal scrutiny, but under uh, a lot of uh, discrimination, community discrimination, not so much here. We don't see it so much here, but across the country. And those two are, are Arabic and Russian. And I don't believe that those two were included. They were mentioned by the community as Councilmember Sawyer was alluding to his appreciation of that. But the way the vote was is that the, the languages were determined by self uh, representation to the census. And the Russians are not going to check that box because they don't want the government to know that they're speaking Russian. And it's the same with Arabic or Muslims. 
They're not going to self-identify because they speak English perfectly well, most of them. And they don't even care if the government doesn't know that they don't speak English perfectly well. They would just as soon check the box that that's their primary language because they don't want to be subject to this uh, intense scrutiny and uh, which there is and and deep uh, you know since 9/11 very uh, problematic issues uh, particularly for Muslim um, similarly for Russia if what if we go to war against Russia so well, it didn't happen exactly the way you're saying uh, John and I, I I wish it did thank you very much thank you thanks Thomas anyone else Eileen we have no additional hands raised at this time okay thank you very much well if there's if there are no other um, comments from from the panel I want to thank Victoria and Eddie and Raisa and Alan and Jeff and Brandilyn and Eileen um, for this a, been a great meeting um, I look forward to um, to March or whatever date is necessary to come forward with the with the um, with the product that I know will be um, comprehensive and well received by the by the, the the council I know that they're looking forward to it as well so at that point I will bring the meeting to a close thank you all very much thank you all